We've just watched at least some of a film made by Michelle Fox. And I'm now going to introduce you just briefly to the panel that we have here to talk about some of the themes in there. So it might be good for people who perhaps don't know you, if you could just raise your hand or say yes, hi, <laughs> when I say your name. So I have Michelle Fox here, who was the director and producer of the film. Yes, I have uh, Laura Pigcock here, who needs very little introduction, local hero. Um, and we've got Rosie Lewis, who is from the Angelou Centre in Newcastle, who does amazing work with being women there. And we've got Anne Schofield, who is a councillor in Newcastle City Council. She's also on the Regional Labour Board and she is the women's officer, the Labour Women's Officer for Newcastle Central. So we've got a wide range of experience on this panel. Um, what we thought we could do today, and it'll be a very informal discussion, what we thought we could do is think, think about some of the themes within that film, because one of the things that really struck me and Michelle when we were making it together and talking about it was that lots of the women in there were given very negative narratives and changed them into positive ones. And that's very inspiring for women. And so we thought maybe what we could cover today is maybe three small areas, which is, first of all, who creates the narrative for women? How do we break into that narrative to change it? And how is, do we as women break out of the narrative for ourselves and to support other women to do that? Um, and so what I'm going to do is rather than spend a lot of time talking about the background, because I'm pretty certain any, every woman who's in this webinar and every woman who's watching on Facebook Live has got some experience of that negative narrative whether it's we've been told that when rape happens, it's our fault because we're in the wrong place, the wrong time, said the wrong thing, wearing the wrong clothes, whether it's when you get a job and you, they say you're no good because you've got children at home. There's masses of things and everybody will have experienced some of those at some point, I'm sure. So just going straight in, Laura, can I ask you the first question? Um, You've got had the privilege, or it might be the punishment, whichever way you look at it, of being in Parliament and being amongst the legislators, the policy makers. You've also had to deal with the media. You've had to help women in your own constituency with a variety of problems. From your perspective, who do you think it is? that is the main writers of the narrative for women in our society? Mm, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, I think whoever has the kind of power, wealth and confidence to um, be the, 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 the writers of it, I think what, what I kind of noticed from being a socialist feminist in, um, in politics is that when you are trying to articulate something which is person, uh, perfectly rational to yourself uh, and perfectly reasonable and common sense to yourself, uh, but it's anti-capitalist, so it goes against the status quo or is socialist or is anti-racist kind of in a framework of racism and oppression, um, there comes punishment <laughs> and there comes um, a kind of whittling away at your self-esteem, your, um, your words. And to be honest, in that space in Westminster and like, in, in elements of the mainstream media, there's so much outrage um, that is orchestrated outrage um, that obviously doesn't exist when uh, there are voices uh, replicating the status quo, um, upholding the status quo, um, and that's why you know I believe I don't I don't believe in individualizing anything that happened to me or anything that happens to other women. Like it's a collective working class uh, struggle, and by working class I mean that 
in all its diversity and the kind of 99% analogy of working class, which has kind of revolutionary potential. So really who, who writes history, who writes the framework, who uh, people are shaped by their consciousness, aren't they? And, um, and who kind of creates the consciousness? Well, it's a capitalist consciousness, I think, that, we've, that, that uh, many of us are subject to. And um, that capitalist consciousness is to try and get you to feel so exhausted sometimes with the struggle that you won't resist. Uh, hence like the, the absolute necessity of events like this of, of as I said before collectivizing every single struggle because obviously we can only kind of fight back against that in our numbers yeah I'm, I'm just I'm sort of interested in the media a bit because one of the things that really strikes me is that the media has a huge role to play in creating whatever the narrative is in society I thought people might just be interested, seeing as we would just watch a film, and I think film is one of the real drivers for narratives in our society. Um, everybody watches films, and it's amazing some of the statistics around films. So I'm just going to ask everybody here just to think for a moment about what the, these figures might be. In 2018, of the top 100 grossing movies around the world, just think how many, what's the percentage of those movies that were directed by men? What would you think would be the percentage of the top 100 grossing movies that were directed by men? <laughs> right, I can tell you now, it's, it's, <laughs> it's 96 percent oh, I thought it was 95. Yeah. Yeah. right so let's think about the writing because that the script is really what we're going to be watching anyway of that same 100 top grossing movies how many do you think then what's the percentage that were written by men if you want to think about that it's actually 85 percent and then if we think about journalists who no doubt sort of set the agenda in lots of ways. Of the journalists that we have, we've got a pretty good split. But then when you start to think of the senior management positions, when you're thinking about editors, and you're thinking about the people who are deciding what's on the front page, what's, what's on your TV screen, what percentage do you think of those are men? It's actually 73% that are men. So actually some of the narratives I think that we're being given in society are the way they are because they're largely men that are giving them. So can I ask you Michelle in terms of film and thinking about the narrative within film why do you think women have never broken into the film industry? Um. Well, it's interesting because I think when it first started out, in, especially in the Hollywood film industry, women were quite um, prominent in terms of because all of the scribes were women and they sat in on the sort of script meetings and they um, were sort of taking all the notes and then went away with the kind of bullet points for want of a better description and formed a script. And that was kind of like commonplace. They weren't recognised necessarily as the writers. But then, and you also had, I think, certainly sort of some of the early movies there was some quite feisty female characters in those films um uh which uh I'm trying to think of uh, an example sorry I, you've caught me off that it's all right I, know. Know that. I was thinking more in general terms anyway about you oh, know okay. if we're thinking I, we break into the narrative well how how are we going to do that in things like film and journalism because as long as we're not at the table and contributing it's hard to see how that's going to happen yeah and I think the thing as well is with film because film is a business and people kind of run it like a business and inevitably it's always been very male dominated and it's been run by men the investors have been men and mostly I think the sort of the female characters that have been emerging out of that 
have kind of hit a bit of a wall, thankfully, now where they're fed up with um, certainly a lot of actresses are having a lot more clout in, in Hollywood. So they're starting to make a lot more noise about um, becoming producers as well. Like Reese Witherspoon's a fantastic example of that. And I think that they are starting to make inroads in television, but the nature of film is just, um, it's, it's so difficult anyway to, to break into. I think um, women are very easily excluded from it because it doesn't accommodate, it doesn't accommodate anybody who has, um, you know, who can't just drop everything in their life. You know, the, the, the way that the systems are set up is very much focused on, it's been designed by men and it works for men. So I think it would have to, the way to change it would be to start looking at film productions like people like Reese Witherspoon, Nicole Kidman, and people like that who are actually designing these productions that are um, made by women, produced by women. Um, all of the roles on set are women as well. And um, and then you start to you start to see a difference as well in the type of stories that are getting told. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, it, when I looked at those statistics, and they are like, wow, kind of statistics, I think. One yeah. of the things, Rosie, that absolutely hit me was, if that's the statistics for women, what will the statistics be like for being women? It must be off the chart. I, I mean, if you start to look at all of the different statistics around um, people who are black, Asian, etc., I mean, all of those statistics are terrible, really, before you start. And then when you put women into the frame. So I know you work extensively with being women in trying to help them to change their narratives into positive ones. So what sort of things do you think that we can do to actually help women and being women? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I'll talk a bit about the film stuff as well. I mean, I think one of the key things to say is we don't really regard like we help. We regard ourselves to be part of like a collective, you know, movement towards change. And I think the key part of this, and it is, it's kind of reflective of the stuff around women in film or the narratives around women is that these, these narratives are about, but they're never necessarily by or for. And that's the key that's the key difference. So, so somebody's feeding back. I'm getting feedback on, on this here. Yeah. Yeah, so, like but me. I would say that media film, it's very representative and indicative of the systemic inequality, structural and institutional oppression. So these narratives, whether they're in film, in media, they tend to represent those wider inequalities um, and those wider structures of dominance so obviously we need to bring in the bigger bigger narratives around us which are which are very much structured and formed by capitalism patriarchy etc and i think particularly now thinking about because this isn't something that that hasn't that hasn't dynamically changed in terms of the way that oppression has been perpetrated or the way that narratives of of women and uh people of colour and people who are marginalised has been manipulated. And that's very much thinking about the last kind of 20, 30 years of neoliberalism, the way that labour, capital, exploitation has been manifested. And I think one of the key, you know, um, for me, thinking about um, historically about women's collectivism, about narratives, about media, if you go back to the 70s, there's a really interesting period in our collective feminist history. And that is when um, women, and this is pre-advanced capitalism, so it was, it was more doable, but this is when women had the means of production, yeah? So we've got to look at who owns the media, yeah? Who, who, who has the funding? Who has the money, the capital? How is labour distributed within, within those systems? Yep. So what you find is, as Michelle referenced, is you had a lot of women who were doing the note-taking, the running about, et cetera, et cetera. But actually they, weren't, they were never going to have control of the narratives because they didn't have the power, the finance, the money. And I think something that I'm probably going to keep talking about is systemic, institutional and structural um, oppression and how that informs all of the narratives that are around us you know so it's not just money and resources it's thinking about the way that we talk about as, as feminists about intersectionality 
But I think there's one of the key things to understand about intersectionality, and that is it's actually about looking at intersectional oppression. Yep. And how those different forms of oppression combine to have control and dominance um, over people and to subjugate people and to ex exploit people. So I'll, I'll leave it there for going yeah. to the... Um, you know, Laura, just coming back to you there, Rosie's talking about, you know, the people who own the stuff control the stuff. So how on earth do we get past that? Because the, we're not going to suddenly as women be able to buy up everything. We're not going to be able to buy up the media. And is there any way that from a politics point of view, we can legislate for this to try and spread some of the power across? different groups, not just women, but also BAME people. And we'll be mentioning the disabled in a moment, but you know, disabled people as well, generally all the people who don't often have all the money, really. Well, yeah, this is why like when I've, like, I've enjoyed all of the contributions and I was thinking about, um, it, it's a bit of a kind of false analogy sometimes to be like, why aren't there enough being women in film or women in film or women in, you know in control of the narrative on film most exclusion is bla is because of uh, economic relationship with the state and so um i've never been this is why i'm a socialist feminist because i think your kind of anti-capitalist position for me is the only way to get to women's liberation rather than being a feminist uh, in support of the dominant economic system which fundamentally exploits our labor unpaid in the home and and and, and undervalues kind of paid work outside of the home exploits us extracts a profit um and from from our wages essentially and and so that's why I've never really been interested in how many women CEOs there are. If those women CEOs are keeping other women in positions of poverty, working class women in positions of poverty, um, or how many film directors there are, if they're still portraying uh, maybe a stereotypical narrative of, of working class communities, or if they're still, uh, I don't know, perpetuating um, the fantasy of this capitalist system being good for women at all. So, 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 so it's not like let's all become the owners. It's about let's take control and and taking control. You know, through one legislative way was um, you know about I believe in a system of sectoral collective bargaining where terms and conditions and rates of pay are not imposed upon women, but they're negotiated as equals. Um, and, you know, there are different strands of thought, as you know, kind of revolutionary politics, reformist politics, but essentially, um, yeah, I've never been a feminist that is about us just kind of having more people in those positions of power within the existing structures. I think we need to change the structures and certainly the economic system. Can I come right. in there? Yeah, sorry. Of Can I come back in just be really quickly in terms of what Laura is saying? Absolutely, you know, in terms of strands of liberal feminism. But I think we we really need to be promoting an intersectional analysis, you know, because actually we can talk about capitalism, labour, etc. But there are strands around the forms of oppression that women face that are often based upon the intersecting um identities but not just the identities that they assume but also those that are imposed because so for instance one of the key things that's always said about about women who are marginalized is the barriers those women have no they're imposed barriers by the state or by or socially or politically or whatever and i think leslie in the chat in the q a chat um leslie sorry i haven't got your surname talked about um how this is historically rooted absolutely it is historically rooted and i think that often we don't have that relationship or understanding um, of the way that historical inequalities have been very set. And again, I'll go back to labour and capital, and that's a really um, informed understanding of the way that historical inequalities um, have progressed over the years in very different contexts. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it there because I know I've talked for a long time. Anne, <laughs> Anne, you want to come in? Oh, you're on mute, Anne. You've muted yourself. <laughs> I thought you were doing it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say I'm totally with um, Laura, Laura and um, Rosie, but my interest has always been um, in terms of agents of change, women as agents of change, 
and we have um, all sorts of um, silly questions about why are there no um, revolutionary re leaders, why are there no women who are really pushing the change and one of my great interests is to bring forward and make clear how many women have been seriously, black women, women of colour, all sorts of women of uh, every generation from Bodicea have been really significant in um, movements for change and particularly revolutionary change. And many of the women have actually, ordinary women have actually triggered revolutions. So mm -hmm. when they see their families at risk of poverty, of, of hunger, um, they've taken to the streets in a very forceful way. I mean, they, the, uh, the French Revolution, the Revol uh, Russian Revolution, it was the women who started it. But you don't know, hear anything of that. And if I asked you all one of your questions, name me four significant leaders of revolutionary change, I bet you'll only come up with, uh, it's not fair, but I think you'll come up with Rosa Luxemburg instead of the hundreds and hundreds that there are. So I think in terms of what um, is being said, we have to see that, um, I mean, I'm a socialist feminist as well, and I'm really proud of that. Um, and I, that's why I agree absolutely with Laura, but I think we have to see what women have to go through to go from all sorts of what is expected of a woman to having a sort of consciousness that they can bring about change and all the sort of prejudices that they suffer to, to do that. So it's no good just talking about class. You have to talk about women within the class and what's happening to them and how we can support women to um, move on um, from what's expected of them in their traditional roles to being agents of change. And I think we as women owe that. Yeah, we did actually have a question but from a kid, Bromwich Alexander, who asked the question about our narrative being silenced, that it wasn't actually so much about the, the narrative being negative, it was more about that there's no bleeding na narrative at all, <laughs> because we just end up being silenced within the media. The work that I've been doing, um, looking at revolutionary women or women in revolution, um, it was a real shock to me. I went right the way through the canon of works on revolution and women were not, they were just absent. <laughs> and that was way back in the 19th century and it's still true now. So that silencing of women and what their role and, and their contribution, I think is the key. Yeah. I think one of the most silent groups in our society actually, um, and I know somebody's asked a specific question about this, is people with disabilities. And so women with disabilities, I think, have very specific problems um, in that, you know, not only are, is the narrative never told, but also sometimes they find it very difficult to get out there. Rosie, I know you've done some work with people with disabilities. What's your thoughts on that? So again, I think that um, sometimes our language is so limited, isn't it? But um, just generally, you know, it's like, it's hard. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, um, I would say that we we all we all have a responsibility, and again, going back to that understanding of in, of intersectionality, and for us, one of the key things, and for me as a black feminist, and I I, I call myself a black feminist, not in terms of the um, um, identity, but in terms of a way of thinking, viewing, analysing things, because what's really important about black feminism and its approaches, intersectionality has always been at the heart of it. Okay, intersectionality was named by Kimberly Crenshaw in the 90s, but it's been going on for centuries in terms of through black feminist viewpoint, because black women or women of colour could not only be identified as women, yeah? They were seen through race, and then obviously we can see women through other lenses such as class, sexuality, etc. So one of the really, I think, central parts of the work that we do and the collectivist work that, that I'm involved in is around being led by and for. So making sure that any discussion about any, um, any groups of women, identities of women, or women who face these imposed barriers or women who have um, you know, for instance, uh, face ableism, whether that's um, to do with disabilities that are hidden or visible. It's about making sure that, again, going back to the narratives, that the, the decision making and the understanding and the taking forward of any issues is led by and for. And are any, any of us that are, um, as, as feminists, as women, I feel that there is, a, and as people who've got a social responsibility to make sure we create spaces, platforms and support so that women can have the space to be able 
to speak about their own experiences. And really, if we keep that narrative around the actual experiences that women have, within whatever identity that may be, or whatever oppression they face, I think it's a really important way forward. So to go back to that, thinking about this being around structural oppression, as, as well as it being about these multiple imposed barriers, and the way that women are often invisibilized when they're marginalized, um, I think we have to see that there's, there's not just a category of women with disabilities, yeah, there are, there are many different identities within that and understanding that is really, really important. I also think that we have to think about spheres of inequality. So like I said before, it's not just about intersectionality in a personalised way, it's also about understanding it in terms of intersectional oppression and how those forms of oppression, you know, come together and they create, again, those multiple imposed barriers. So I think it's really important that as a movement, we're able to stand, you know, where, where it's needed, um, in support of, behind, at times maybe, um, as we've learned from Black Lives Matter, if we need to stand in front to protect and support, but also that we make mm -hmm. sure that any of the decision making, because this is a really, really important part, part uh, to me um, within the movement, that any decision, is, decision making is by and for. And I'm going to mention some just very um, kind of um, mechanistic kind of things that are going on that I think are really, really important for us to consider in, as a movement in relation to any of these intersecting identities or multiple oppressions or uh, barriers that impose barriers that people face. The public sector equality duty, really, really important. Yeah, it's very rarely being upheld. So the public sector equality duty really impacts on who has services and who doesn't. And at the minute, Women with disabilities, women of colour, migrant women, etc., do not have equal equitable access to services and don't have equitable support from the state as they should have. Yeah, there's stuff that's going on today as we speak. I'm just waiting to hear the conclusion, which is probably out, but around the domestic abuse bill. Yep. So obviously, a lot of the Angeli Centre services around violence against women and girls. It's a key barrier that all women face and women with disabilities, migrant women, women of colour are absolutely invisibilised by the state and are not given the support that they should have. And finally, I just want to mention CEDAW and a shout out for the Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. It is a mechanism that holds our state to account and we totally underutilise it, our movement underutilises it. And I want to shout it from the rooftops because within that, what's brilliant about it is it has intersectionality running through it. So it looks at all areas Areas of political, social, economic life of women. It's um, at a UN convention. It holds it holds our state or any other international states to account. Yeah, and what happens is it looks into every area, whether that's around employment, children, political life, and within that is what where where are women with disabilities? Where are where are um, migrant women? Where are women of colour, etc. So again, I'll, I'll I'll leave it there. But I just wanted to really shout yeah, out that. Very, that's good, really good. We've got um, somebody. Stephanie has asked a question. I think which is around solidarity, actually, which is around: Do women end up being silenced by other women who may not have the same political or hierarchical ideas? And that's an interesting one, I think, because you know we're talking about how it is that we can bond together to be able to promote change for women but do you feel that what could we do really in terms of trying to get solidarity amongst women because that does seem you know we've had lots of things recently haven't we in the press particularly about you know the Labour Party other organizations as well where it seems like there seem a fair, a fair amount of infighting and I don't, my experience, although that's a stereotype thing of women, that's certainly not my experience of women. But does anybody want to field a question about that, whether that exists or whether we can do something about it? Wait, 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 did you say um, young women uh, who are faced? In no, I think, I think it just the question is women. So women, do okay. women end up yeah. being silenced by other women? I think that's entirely possible. And it's, I think... Speaking as a socialist feminist, again, it's one of the hardest things to face, that, that that's happening. And when you see women who climb their way up and then they pull the ladder up so other women can't get up, um, I think that's one of the most shocking things to see. And that goes across all parties. 
it's um, I think deep in politics at the moment um, and it's actually shameful um, and so quite a lot of us are now saying we have to sort of go outside of uh, party politics for a while and start to have real conversations with each other um, which bring about solidarity that don't actually get us into this is my view that's your view you're wrong I'm right sort of dynamic which is completely false but I would also say that I think women have been to a large extent pushed into that um, and it's a, a, a one of the great sort of things about oppression is in the end those who, the oppressors don't need to do anything because they get the people who are oppressed doing it all for them and I think a lot of women are in that situation of arguing and competing um, getting into really hate type conversations um, rather than collaborating and seeing what the common what their common cause is and I afraid I'm going to do a plug for Jeremy Corbyn here I think when he said we need a new kind of politics he was absolutely right and we need a new kind of politics for women too so yeah I mean, in terms of the Labour Party, because I think most people in this webinar are going to be Labour supporters or members. What is it that the Labour Party can do? I mean, this film was made in conjunction with North Tyneside Labour Women's Branch. Um, I would really strongly recommend everybody to join. If, there, if you're a Labour member, join your local women's branch because they're amazing supportive places. But do we feel that the Labour Party could do more to help in this area? Laura, you might be a good one to ask. You've been right on the inside. Um, I think that, I think there's a, a, an emerging culture in, in popular society which, um, is only helpful of the right actually and not helpful of the left and that is around kind of feeling like you have concluded what is morally right and not and if you are on a journey of understanding then you can be sometimes very publicly cancelled if you like now what I am not advocating for here whether it be about you know I spent eight and a half years as an anti-racism worker in um in the northeast and had hundreds of thousands of conversations um not hundreds of thousands that's an embellishment hundreds maybe thousands of conversations <laughs> probably thousands of probably conversations hundreds of thousands really. about racism with with young people some who were on like um de-radicalization like for far right radicalization programs and like you had to sit through a lot of awful stuff like really unpalatable crap about uh you know people who have come here from other countries for whatever reason and uh, it's painful to listen to but obviously in that space you challenge it and there is growth with with some of those young people and they've been completely subjected to these structural as rosie keeps reminding us these you know systemic structural uh messages which uphold like lots of those prejudices so i don't ever want to say that like say a young person with misogynistic views, with racist views, should um, not be listened to, should be shut up, should not be engaged with. That's an awful, um, awful kind of um, outlook. I really believe that there is the potential for change you know of course there is a, but I believe that as an adult too and I believe that I am an imperfect person that has got so much more reading to do like I absolutely love listening to people and the dream is that I'll come out of a meeting thinking and I've this has happened to me so many times in feminist spaces where other women have said do you know what Laura you are talking absolute rubbish and these are the reasons why and like at first you're a bit like oh my god like I've offended someone else like, and you go like get a bit self-indulgent but you come out the other end a changed person and like your consciousness is being raised and those are the kind of environments I think that we need to be cultivating woman a woman to try and raise each other's con consciousness and um, to bring us to a better collective understanding as a movement not just so that like we're all morally pure but that we collectively go forward with a better consciousness um, and that takes patience it takes understanding that people are going to say things that hurt it takes a willingness to change yourself um and, and and all of that so i i i don't want to silence any woman the system does that well enough um and i don't kind of buy into these like oh you know women are kind of 
not confident, you know, you know, the, the, there's confidence and a spirit of rebellion in getting up in the morning as a woman. Um, never mind all of the different oppressions, because uh, Rosie's absolutely right. The way oppression is played out within the system is, is different, dependent on, on aspects of your identity without, without a doubt. Um, but yeah, like I want us to get to a point as women where we can create as many spaces as possible to improve each other's consciousness in that spirit of a better collective understanding of our of our oppression. So what is you're talking about creating spaces, and I think that's really important as well. Um, what can we individually do to support or create those spaces? Anne? Yes, I mean, I think um, we have to put the word democratic in front of spaces. Um, there's lots of spaces, lots of the colleges have got spaces, they've got green spaces that they're private. I think one of the things that we need to do is to democratise our spaces and make them so that they're open and inclusive for everybody so that it isn't that you're in this group or that group, but you're in a democratic space that's open for everybody and that's where real change happens. I just wanted to say to Laura that for the first time in very, very many years, um, I was told recently on... I, I raised something and I was told, and I'm afraid it was by a man, there is no debate. And if you try and have a debate, I'm afraid I shall silence you. And my only reply is, it's many years that I meant since a man's said that to me. Um, I didn't listen in the early days and I'm not listening now. But, you know, that is a very frightening thing to have for some women to have said to them. And um, I think there's a lot of that going on. There is no debate uh, going on. So opening up to democratic spaces for all women, I think. Is, is great. Yeah, that's great. Um, I've got a question from Leslie Spillard, actually. Um, I won't put anybody on the spot here, but she's asking for recommendations of books. Because one of the things you were talking about there, Laura, was almost like educating yourself a bit and sort of thing. I won't put anybody on the spot and say, say a book, because I can never think of one off the top of my head. But does anybody want to mention anything? Rosie, you're, shit, you're nodding your head. Can you think of something that um, yeah, a book yeah. would be really... So, I, mean, I, I, I think like a super accessible, brilliant read, um, brilliant reads that basically tap into all of the complex issues, but do so from an experiential point of view and in a way that's accessible because I think that it's really important for our politics and our collective work be accessible as Audre Lorde. So Audre Lorde, um, so she was a black feminist and she called herself a black feminist, lesbian, activist, warrior. Um, and she was, um, she absolutely outlines intersectionality within all her work, but she was a poet. She was an author. She wrote a brilliant book called Zami. She was, um, as well as writing a lot of, uh, like she's got um, many different collect um, sorry, collections of um, essays and it's those essays so like um, um, around um, around health and illness around inequality around racism around structural and systemic oppression um, and m when you actually read them you'll realize there's loads of quotes that have been lifted from her constantly you know um, so yeah I would absolutely say Audre Lorde for anybody at, at an entry level yeah and Zami is somebody's actually put that on Zami is an absolutely brilliant book it's totally underplayed and if you want to think about narratives she actually defined um, a, a narrative in a biomethography and it brings in some of what Laura and Anne have been talking about we need spaces to be able to contradict ourselves and actually Audre Lorde is a very good example of someone who's been become an icon and she's been lifted from a movement actually her her a lot of her uh, work was reflective of movement and collective action yeah and she's been lifted and um, canonized like the way that the odd token black woman is um, but actually what's really important uh, about her work is there is space for contradiction there is space to be wrong there is space to make mistakes and I think that's fundamental when we're talking about movement building and many of the issues that we talked about in terms of why do our collectives not work? Why do we, um, you know, uh, keep imploding? Because that is a, a recurrent theme. And just finally, I want to say that in terms of talking about why the, why our collective movement, movements, women's movements, sometimes women um, can um, create situations that are really difficult within these movements, small and bigger movements, etc. And this kind of no platforming thing that's going on, you know, alongside the internalized misogyny, internalized racism, all the way that works, again, going back to 
us thinking about we need to tackle this as a system. We need to tackle the state. We need to depersonalize this because that's exactly what happens to women again and again. It becomes individualized and it hangs on you, whether that's a blame um, for being a, a victim of domestic violence or rape, or whether it's about the fact that we are basically, you know, exploited as in terms of unpaid labor. You know, it's very much an individualized approach. So I'll leave it there. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, I agree. Um, it's a really interesting discussion, isn't it? Um, and I, I really agree with that. The, my only problem is, I mean, the, the, the book that uh, recently had a huge effect on me is Alexander Kollontai, um, her autobiography and, and her work generally, Russian uh, revolutionary. Um, and I'd say that because, um, and this is what I wanted to say to Rosie, really, that this was a revolution that was going against the state. It reformed another state, I agree. But um, within that revolution, women had a very hard time and the men saw themselves as the leaders and the women were there to do the minor jobs. And Alexander Kollontai, why I so like her stuff, uh, I mean, she's written um, novels, everything, is that she lived by her theory. So she believed women should be able to be who they are and what they are and live the, the life they wanted to do. And that was the theory that she brought forward um, it wasn't popular uh, within revolutionary circles. Um, she was told to, that uh, that was not a good thing, um, but she did live by it and she suffered by it terribly. But to have somebody who's prepared to live and then write about, a, a woman to live and write about what, what, not just the theory, but then to live by it and then to talk about what it meant to live by it. So that for me has been, Sorry, Audrey Audrey Lord. Davis, I have to say, who was one of my yeah. kids in my youth. <laughs> Audrey Lord absolutely lived by, she wasn't yeah. a theory, she that absolutely it. lived by what she did, yeah, absolutely. It is that that's the key, I think, to exciting reading, really, yeah. yeah. Um, we've only got three minutes before we're going to be due to finish. Um, I think it's been a really interesting discussion. I mean, personally, what I've taken away from it is that... Certainly capitalism is part of the issue in terms of trying to give everybody who is in a sl an oppressed situation the ability to be able to, to expand themselves and get some power and have a narrative at all. Um, and that we all of us need to be organised, really, get some safe spaces together. Do you want to add something, Anne? I just want to say we have to learn the lessons of COVID, um, yeah. what's been happening through COVID, um, and women have taken the brunt of it, and a high percentage of those are um, black and minority ethnic women who are on, in the workforce, but also women have done the caring, etc. They've also had the most violence. It's been a 20% rise in violence during COVID, and that has to be explained. And we're not talking about general frustrations. We're talking about women who suffer serious injury and death trapped at a home with their abuser. So I think we need really to take this whole thing of COVID on and learn from it. Sorry to add to that. No, I think, I think to be honest, that's probably the case right across society, isn't it? If we don't- it's Well, across the world. In COVID, then we're all stuffed, aren't we really? Because <laughs> there's been some hideous lessons that we've had to look at. Um, yeah, so we're coming up to the quarter past. Thank you, everybody for your contribution i'm going to leave on a quote actually and as you can imagine it's a quote by a man because it, and when you hear what it is it's obvious why it says history will be kind to me for i intend to write it yeah. and winston churchill said that and as we know if it had been a woman along with what you were saying and if that had been a woman we would never heard the saying in the first place and she wouldn't have been able to write it and so we've got to do something to change that and I think having these kinds of events and getting together to talk together. And I agree with what you say, Rosie, about a, a safe spaces for women to be able to express themselves and to be able to talk about the issues that face them and um, to organise together to try and make things better for us all. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, you, everybody, I'm sorry if we didn't manage to get through different questions and that there might have been areas that we didn't touch on that people wanted, but it's impossible. And I'm terribly sorry if there was any technical issues along the way. But thank you very much, everybody. And hopefully... Right. Well done. Well done. Val. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.